This is Where We Live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel, broadcasting remotely. Humans haven't been to the moon since 1972, but a new generation of astronauts could make that journey in the next decade. Today, where we live, we talk with Kayla Barron, an astronaut who's training with NASA's Artemis program. It's the space agency's modern lunar exploration program. Now, before NASA, Barron was a member of the first class of women commissioned into the submarine service in the U.S. Navy. And she spent some of her early career in Groton, Connecticut at the Naval Submarine Base. We hear about her trajectory from sailor to astronaut just ahead. Now, do you have a young, aspiring astronaut in your life, or do you have questions about NASA's next moon mission? You can join the conversation, 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WMPR. You can share a comment on our Facebook page or find us on Twitter at Where We Live. Again, Kayla Barron is joining us via Zoom. Again, she is a member of the Astronaut Corps for NASA's Artemis program. Kayla, welcome to the show. Thanks, Lucy. Thanks for having me. I was talking with my producer about how when we're young, uh, so many of us will say, I'd love to become an astronaut. So when you were a kid, did you dream about becoming an astronaut? You know, a lot of my friends and colleagues here at NASA did, but for me, <laughs> my story is a bit different. You know, I grew up knowing about astronauts and being aware of the amazing things that NASA was doing, particularly with the space shuttle program and building the early space station. But for me, it was something I never really envisioned myself being able to do um, and wasn't a specific goal I had in mind. Um, from a pretty young age, though, I did want to serve in the military when I was uh, 14, 9-11 happened, and I was really inspired by the way our country came together during that period, and it made me dedicated to serving in some capacity. And so during my time in high school, that focus kind of came into join, joining the Navy and going to the Naval Academy. Um, and so for me, I was dedicated to be a Naval officer and finding the best way to serve in the Navy, but it wasn't actually until I served on submarines that I realized how many connections there are between serving, working, living on a submarine, and working and living in space. And it was those connections that really inspired me to want to apply to be an astronaut and eventually believe that it might be something I was capable of doing. It is an interesting path. So you're a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis. And I mentioned earlier, you were part of the first group of U.S. women commissioned to submarine service. Uh, you know, most people will never spend time in the ocean at the depths that submarines go for months at a time. And certainly most of us will never go to space. Have you ever have you seen yourself as an explorer uh, in your lifetime? Definitely. You know, I grew up as a pretty adventurous little kid. I love to run around in the woods and the mountains. And when we went on hikes, I would often end up far off the trail exploring. Um, and I think that's one of the common threads among my colleagues here at NASA is all of us are really explorers. And we've acted on that instinct to go see what's beyond our own knowledge and really push ourselves both as individuals and members of a team in really extreme circumstances. And I think for me, uh, that connection is really important as we start thinking about the Artemis program that you mentioned on the read-in. You know, I think people ask, you know, why return to the moon? Why go now? And I think for us, we really feel that itch to start exploring again. You know, after 20 years of living and working on the space station, we're pretty good at living and working in low Earth orbit. We know how to do that and we do it really well. But we're excited to go explore areas of the moon that, you know, the Apollo astronauts didn't get a chance to and really start to learn more, not only about the moon, but what the moon can teach us about the other planets in our solar system, including the Earth. And we'll be talking more about this modern lunar exploration program again, NASA's Artemis program. Uh, Kayla Barron, uh, my guest today, uh, part of this a group of astronauts training for the Artemis program. And I wanted to learn a little bit more about what it's like to serve on a submarine. So, uh, you know, in the ocean again, and depths that many of us, you know, will never experience. 
Yeah, you know, I when I joined the Navy and started at the Naval Academy, I was convinced that I wanted to be a Navy fighter pilot. And I was really motivated about trying to serve in that part of the Navy and that community. But I pretty quickly found that the mentors I was drawn to were all submarine warfare officers. And there was something about, you know, their technical engineering mindset, but also their understanding of what it took to operate on a really high functioning team and challenging environments that I found really attractive. And then I also got the opportunity in the summers between um, my school years to go aboard a submarine and get underway on a submarine. And it was that experience that really, you know, inspired me to want to serve in that capacity. It was amazing to watch the ship submerge and see all of the individual specialties, the individual members of the team come together as this cohesive unit to operate a really complex machine in a super challenging environment underneath the surface of the ocean. Um, it was, just felt like something I wanted to be a part of. And it, it felt like the type of people that I really wanted to learn from and work with. And so that's what drove me to want to be in the community. And then once I got there, that was just true in spades. It's a super challenging environment, especially as a young leader. You're asked to take on a lot of responsibility at a pretty young age, whether that's overseeing the nuclear reactor plant and all of the machinery in the engine room, or ultimately controlling the whole operation of the entire ship, um, you know, driving the ship and making all the decisions about uh, where the submarine's going to go and what we're going to do. Um, and while that's pretty intimidating because you have that incredible group of super talented sailors around you to help support you and teach you, uh, it's an incredible opportunity to learn at really on the edge of your abilities at the beginning. And then by the end, um, as you get better and your team comes together, um, it's super fulfilling to work in that environment. I mentioned you were part of the first group of women to serve in uh, what was previously a completely male service. I think that was in uh, women to be submarine warfare officers. Why did it take the Navy so long? Did it have to do with the way submarines were designed? Uh, that's a really good question. You know, it's hard hard for me to say from my perspective what the senior leadership in the Navy was thinking about. Um, and how often they even reevaluated that status quo. Um, I do know that when I was a senior at the Naval Academy, the stars kind of aligned in terms of who were the officers and the civilian leadership um, in the White House and elsewhere, uh, all who were looking really critically at roles in the military that women were still not allowed to serve in. And there were, you know, there needed to be a really good reason if uh, women weren't going to be allowed the opportunity to serve um, in these new arenas. And when you look at the submarine force, you know, a lot of it comes back to, you know, assumptions and tradition, in my opinion, mm -hmm. um, because there's really no reason women can't work and succeed in those environments. And I think the transition to including women in the community has proven that to be true. Um, the professionalism of the sailors and officers in the submarines um, has been really impressive to me throughout that transition. And now it's really business as usual. Um, so I think once once the community decided that that's the direction we were going to go, um, everybody really rogered up to that and made it work. So um, we see more women officers and enlisted uh, women uh, sailors uh, in the submarine community today, Kayla? Yeah, absolutely. You know, when it started with our group, it was a pretty small cohort um, and it was only officers at first. Um, and to your question kind of about how submarines are designed, um, it was a little bit, it was natural for a few reasons to start with a officer corps, both to establish a presence of women on board and leadership before broadening it to our enlisted sailors as well, um, but also because it was just easier in terms of where we were gonna live and what bathrooms we were gonna use. The submarines were kind of already set up to support that. Um, and there's been some retrofitting that's been necessary to provide separate bathrooms um, and separate birthing compartments for women, um, for the enlisted sailors aboard submarines. Um, but now, you know, the submarine fleet not all we don't have all of our submarines integrated yet but we're really headed that way um and the ships that are integrated it's it's gone 
almost without major um, problems. So I think it's uh, integration that's going really well and it's going to continue to expand over the coming years. My guest today is NASA astronaut Kayla Barron. Again, she's a member of the Astronaut Corps for NASA's Artemis program. It's the Space Agency's modern lunar exploration program. The aim is to have the first woman and the next man on the moon in the next decade. If you have a question about this uh, upcoming uh, mission of NASA, you can join us, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter, uh, at Where We Live. So let's talk about your training as an astronaut. So you spent time in the, the serving in the U.S. Navy, and uh, when did you decide you were going to try to become an astronaut, and what was the process? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I served my first tour in the submarine force aboard the USS Maine, um, and as an officer in the Navy, you kind of um, switch back and forth between serving on a submarine, going out to sea and deploying, and then a time in a job, we call them shore duty billets, um, but jobs basically that support other things the Navy do, uh, does that helps further our development, but also gives us kind of a break from being um, constantly deploying and out to sea. And so I was lucky enough to return to the Naval Academy to work for Admiral Ted Carter, who at the time was the superintendent of the Naval Academy, kind of the president of the university, um, and help work on his staff. And so during that period, I was doing a lot of reflection. You know, it was the first time that I was able to reevaluate whether I wanted to continue to serve in the Navy or go do something else. Um, and I did ultimately decide that I wanted to stay in the Navy and return to the submarine force. But during that period, when I was figuring all of that out, um, I was able to meet an astronaut through my work with Admiral Carter. Um, and the opportunity to speak with her was really inspiring. Uh, she told me about her time during um, her space shuttle missions where she helped build the space station when it was first coming into existence. And as she told me about you know, the engineering challenges and all the uh, things they overcame, the equipment they were bringing online, all of her stories just reminded me so much of my time on the submarine. And that's when it clicked for the first time, all of those parallels between living and working beneath the surface of the ocean and living and working in space. You know, the same things can kill you, you need the same things to keep you alive, and you need the same kind of team to succeed. Um, and that's when it really clicked for me that, you know, maybe I wanted to and could become an astronaut. Um, but it was intimidating at first, you know, it's not, I'm a, I'm a planner, I'm super type A, and I always think through every little detail of anything I do or might pursue. Um, and I remember I, I got uncertain about it pretty quickly. Um, and a couple weeks after that initial interaction with an astronaut, I was going to another event with my boss at the National Air and Space Museum. And it was this forum about the future of human space exploration. And there were a ton of astronauts there. Um, and I got introduced to a bunch of them by my boss who knew them from his career as a naval aviator. And when we were leaving that night, you know, I found myself so impressed with all of these astronauts and really like the imposter syndrome was strong in that moment. Like I, I felt like I had no business working and serving with people of that stature. And as we were walking down the steps of the museum, my boss turned to me and he said, Kayla, do you know how you become an astronaut? And I, I think I gave him probably a pretty blank deer in the headlights look and just said, you know, I, I don't know how you become an astronaut. And I think he sensed my intimidation and my trepidation about the process. And he just got this big smile on his face and looked me right back in the eye and said, you apply. And you know, for me, that's a story, the, a moment that I'll never forget because, you know, as somebody who overthinks things and was feeling pretty intimidated, you know, he kind of cut through that as a senior mentor and just said, you know, if you don't put yourself out there, you can never become that thing. Um, and that, that encouragement and that trust that, you know, I could be vulnerable and put myself out there and pursue that role is what propelled me to put in my application, which I never thought would succeed, but turns out it did. Um, and so that was kind of my path into the astronaut corps. Um, and I you know, can think of a ton of other moments like that throughout my career where mentors played a really pivotal role in me pursuing new goals.
So you applied and became part of the astronaut candidate class in 2017, and now you're part of NASA's Artemis team. So tell our listeners what that means exactly. When we talk about, uh, again, this aim to return humans to the moon, it, will it happen in phases? Or, and how soon uh, would you find out if you're chosen that you might be going? That's kind of the million dollar question for <laughs> sure. Um, we're definitely, you know, there's a huge amount of excitement here at NASA about the Artemis program and all of the things we're working on to achieve those really big goals. Um, and like you said, it will happen in phases. So um, to date, my training has been sort of, you know, astronaut basic training, the basic skills we need that will apply to sort of any mission we're doing. but. The Artemis team and the Artemis program, things are really starting to come into focus and we're working in a lot of different capacities. We're building a new rocket, a new space capsule that'll take us to space and return us home. We're building lunar landers um, and eventually we'll be building lunar habitats and lunar rovers to explore further and stay on the moon longer. Um, and the near term goals were shooting for are the first Artemis launches. So Artemis one will be an uncrewed launch of the Orion space capsule. Um, and then Artemis II, we're all really excited about because we're gonna put human beings in that space capsule and send them to orbit the moon and return home. Um, and then of course, I think you'll really get people's eyes to light up around here when you start talking about Artemis III, the goal of which is to land human beings on the surface of the moon by 2024 which is just around the corner, especially uh, in space flight preparation years. You know, that's just <laughs> really coming in fast. Um, so we're getting ready to return to the moon and the surface of the moon to do science and also try to learn the skills and develop the technology we need to explore even further into the solar system in the future. Mm. You mentioned the goal is 2024, but we now have a new administration. And so uh, the aim is that, uh, again, this all this work will continue. But can you talk or remind us, uh, Kayla, about the fact that humans haven't been on the moon since the 70s. And when we think about the, this new core of astronauts, you know, uh, how diverse this group is and a little bit about what that means to you. Yeah, of course. I mean, the Apollo program is something that inspires all of us. You know, it's incredible to think that we sent humans to the moon uh, in such a short time frame, you know, with the technology available at the time. And what they were able to accomplish is truly incredible. And I think for the astronaut corps, you know, that that is something that has inspired all of us to want to be astronauts in the first place. And for the past 20 years, we've been living and working in low Earth orbit aboard the International Space Station and been doing some incredible science. And I think we're starting to feel that itch to explore again. And we ultimately, a lot of us really want to go explore Mars, uh, but Mars is, is incredibly far away. Uh, and the engineering challenges, the technical challenges of getting humans there safely are incredible. And so the moon offers this really amazing opportunity to you know, go do new science, go do more exploration, but also to use it as a proving ground for all the technologies we'll need to explore further into the solar system and eventually you know, send human beings to Mars. Um, and so we've really come into focus for the moon being our next step in human space exploration. And like you said, the team looks a lot different now than it did in the Apollo era. And that's a reflection of the, you know, progress in our society, but also of the decades of accomplishments of minorities and women in the astronaut corps since the Apollo era. Um, and so for us, it's only natural that the Artemis team looks a lot more like the American public that it represents because we're all here every day doing that work and preparing ourselves to be ready for that. Um, so I think it's cool that, you know, to us it's business as usual, but we also acknowledge the huge accomplishment it will be to see, you know, a woman step foot on the moon. Um, you know, can't understate the importance of that uh, difference in the Artemis mm -hmm. program. And there are 18 astronauts in this core. How many women, Kayla? 
There are nine women out of the 18 astronauts on the Artemis team. And there's a chance you may be chosen for this uh, uh, phase when this project and uh, program is ready uh, to head uh, to the, the lunar surface. Yeah, maybe. I mean, I think we all have our fingers crossed to be a part of one of those missions that head to the surface, but we're also really committed to each other and the mission. Um, so, you know, if it's not each one of us as individuals, it will be one of our teammates, one of our friends. And so I think no matter what, it's a huge win for the space program and the astronaut office to return to the surface of the moon. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. My guest today, NASA astronaut Kayla Barron, a member of the Astronaut Corps for NASA's Artemis. Again, this is the Space Agency's lunar, modern lunar exploration program. Do you have questions about the next time humans will head to the moon or beyond? You can join us, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalbathanchel, broadcasting remotely. Have you ever wanted to go to space? My guest today is NASA astronaut Kayla Barron. She's among the group chosen for NASA's Artemis program with the goal of returning humans to the moon in the coming years. If she's selected for the mission, she could be the first woman on the moon. Now, Kayla spent some time in Groton, Connecticut early in her naval career, and she was a member of the first class of women commissioned into the U.S. Submarine Service as a submarine warfare officer. You can join us, find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. So when we talk about what it takes to become an astronaut, Kayla, what are the type of skills that you need? What are you learning? Yeah, that's a really awesome question because I think there are so many pathways into the astronaut corps. It's, it's super awesome to look around at my peers and colleagues and see, you know, scientists who either studied planetary geology or slime in deep caves or engineers like me, engineering background or also military backgrounds, whether that's from the submarine force or, you know, the military pilot community, physicians, you know, there's so many ways to enter the astronaut corps, but there are some things that connect us, I think. You know, you have to have a background and an interest in STEM. Um, you have to have a degree in a, in a STEM field as well. That's kind of the only hard requirement. Uh, but beyond that, I think the things that we all have in common, despite that diversity of experience, is we're all explorers. We're all people who challenge ourselves. But critically, we're all people who have experience working on teams. You know, going to space is not something you can do by yourself, certainly not successfully. And so we're really focused on how can we bring all of those people with different experiences, backgrounds, perspectives, and expertise together to accomplish something that in abstract seems almost impossible to do, to go live and work in space and come home safely. Um, that takes a lot of people with a lot of impressive talents and backgrounds. Um, and so I think for people who are interested in becoming astronauts for kids or students, you know, that interest in STEM, like I mentioned, and that willingness to dedicate yourself to studying it is important, but also mm -hmm. developing yourself as an individual, as a leader, but most importantly, as a teammate um, and continuing to challenge yourself in ever, you know, um, more difficult circumstances is a really important thing to do as you prepare yourself to be a part of a team like the one we have at NASA. Can you talk more about your astronaut training when you think about uh, what it takes to be in zero gravity or, or low gravity? So are you using simulators? Are you in pools and airplanes? Yeah, you know, that's a really good question. We, we kind of train as jacks of all trades because 
because there's so few people on our crews and our teams that actually are in space or on the space station, uh, we have to be able to do a lot of different things. And so we train on how to operate the systems aboard the space station that help us get energy or make a clean atmosphere to breathe. Uh, we train on how to conduct the scientific experiments, but there's a lot of, you know, sort of specific astronaut skills that you have to learn and hone during your training, whether that's learning how to operate the robotic arm we have up there or learning how to do a spacewalk. And so spacewalks are a great example of how, how could you possibly train to do a spacewalk in microgravity here on Earth where we're subject to the bounds of gravity. Um, and you're right, we do have a giant pool that we call the Neutral Buoyancy Lab that's 40 feet deep and it has a life-size model of the space station submerged in it. Um, so we put on real spacesuits and go underwater with a team of scuba divers that's constantly moving foam and weights throughout our body to try to simulate what it might feel like in that microgravity environment. And we actually practice full spacewalk procedures from leaving the airlock to working for six hours and coming back to the airlock to come inside. Um, so we've gotten pretty good at figuring out how to simulate the various environments and do our best to prepare ourselves for you know both normal operations and when things aren't going according to plan mm -hmm. while we're still here on earth so that when we face those situations in space we're well prepared uh, ruben from bloomfield has ruben go ahead. hello ruben go ahead hi yeah i have a question i you know you mentioned the apollo missions before Will you be uh, landing any of the new Artemis missions near any of the Apollo uh, sites and possibly retrieving any artifacts they left behind? That's a really good question, Ruben. We are still deciding where the early Artemis missions will land, but right now our plan is to explore new areas of the moon. Um, you know, for us, the, the Apollo program did some amazing things for scientists discovery for understanding both the moon, how it formed, how it evolved over time, but also how that relates to the formation and history of the Earth and other planets in the solar system. Um, but the crazy thing to think about um, in the Apollo program, if you could imagine yourself like never visiting a planetary body, maybe never even stepping foot on Earth and getting just dropped off in the middle of nowhere, and all you can learn about our planet is things that you can reach by walking on foot, you would end up with a pretty limited understanding of what is on the planet Earth and what you might be able to learn about it. And that's kind of a good analog for what we were able to learn from Apollo. We got this incredible discovery, but it's really kind of looking through a soda straw at, at the moon and what we could possibly learn. So we're most interested in exploring new regions. Um, and one, for example, that we're looking at is, is going to the south pole of the moon. There's some really interesting impact craters there that we wanna study. And we also are interested in looking um, to find and maybe even harvest to use as a resource water that's frozen, you know, ice water that could be in the permanently shadowed regions of the moon. Um, so we're really interested in kind of pushing the bounds of what we know about the moon and our solar system by exploring new areas. Now, earlier you mentioned uh, lunar habitats, and so this idea that the Artemis program, you're looking at longer-term longer, longer -term stays on the moon, Kayla? Yeah, the um, early missions will be similar to the ones that we saw in Apollo, where we send a lander to the surface for a few days or maybe a few weeks. But eventually, one of our goals is to have a sustainable human presence on the moon, where we actually send people to live and work on the surface in lunar habitats. You know, and to do that, we have to be able to do, we have to be able to get energy. We have to figure out how to get food and water to those crews um, and how to keep them safe and functioning to do their, you know, spacewalks and the science experiments we're planning to do. Um, but that's really important to us that we're going to the moon to stay this time. You know, Apollo was incredible for you know, doing something that people could hardly imagine, you know, return, going to the moon and returning home safely. But we want to go learn how to live on the surface of the moon this time, um, both for the benefits of, you know, that in and of itself, but also for understanding what will happen when we go to explore Mars, understanding what equipment and technology and operations capabilities we need to survive that far away from home.
Can you talk about this new generation of spacesuits, what they'll look like? I understand you're involved in helping design them. Yeah, I was able to spend some time working with the engineering teams that are designing the two new spacesuits we have for the Artemis program. One of them is our launch and reentry suit that we'll wear inside the Orion uh, space cap capsule for launch and then return home through the atmosphere. Um, and the other one is the new suit that we'll use on the next moonwalk. And it's pretty it's a pretty amazing engineering challenge to not only figure out how do you keep a human being alive in the vacuum of space, but how do you make sure that they can work for six to eight hours, you know, doing geology studies, walking long distances, being able to collect samples and do some pretty tough physical labor in that suit. Um, and how do we enable them not only do that safely, but efficiently. Um, and so NASA has the teams that are developing those suits, and it's pretty incredible what they're what they're coming up with. Some of the really interesting creative ideas um, that are a real you know next generation technology compared to the suit that we use currently aboard the space station. They're working on things like heads up displays, you know, more dexterous gloves so that we have better use of our hands, um, and the ability to do things like kneel down and you know, walk in a normal way um, in the one-sixth gravity environment of the moon. Um, so those are very exciting programs, and we're all really excited to see that suit eventually make it to the surface of the moon. We're almost out of time, but I have to ask, you have a, a great Instagram account. Uh, again, it's, I believe it's uh, Astro uh, Kayla that you can find uh, your pictures of your training. And there's a picture of you where you're practicing uh, sequencing uh, DNA. And, and talk about why that's important to know how to do when you're in space. Yeah, you know, the space station is a national laboratory that's orbiting the Earth. And we do some incredible scientific research there that's really hard to do here on Earth. You know, the microgravity environment is really unique and it allows us to do some amazing work. And being able to sequence DNA in space is a fairly new development. It was done for the first time by Kate Rubens in 2015. And she's actually on the space station again on a, on a mission today. Um, but it allows us to understand, you know, the microbes that might be growing around us to diagnose whether they might be dangerous to our health, but eventually also to help us understand what's happening to our own bodies and maybe diagnose illness when we're on a super long uh, mission. Um, you know, Mars mission might be two or three years. And so we're trying to explore technologies that will help us understand what's happening to the human body. And so we know how to keep our astronauts healthy. Uh, so we get to work with some pretty cool technology. I never really thought I'd be learning how to sequence DNA at all, let alone doing it in space. But that is part of my training these days. Mm. You know, we don't get a chance to hear from NASA astronauts. Uh, so uh, we really appreciate your time, Kayla. And I have to ask you before you go, when you look back at your career, what has been or what will be the hardest part of your training? You know, that's a good question. I think so far the biggest challenge I've had in my career is learning how to work on a submarine, like learning how to stand watch overseeing the nuclear reactor or ultimately drive the ship. Um, and I think that stands out to me because it was real. You know, it was, it was the culmination of a lot of training, but eventually you're actually, you know, the woman in the arena, the one making decisions, that responsibility is lying on your shoulders. And I think I'll feel very similarly when, you know, I'm sitting in my launch seat on the top of a rocket, ready to put all that training to test as I uh, go to space. So I'm looking forward to the opportunity to do that, hopefully in the next few years. Again, Kayla Barron is a NASA astronaut, member of the group of astronauts on NASA's Artemis program. Again, this is the Space Agency's Modern Lunar Exploration Program. So we'll keep watching uh, the, the news headlines, Kayla, to see if you will be chosen to be the first woman on the moon. Kayla, thanks so much. Thanks so much, Lucy. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. After the break, we go back 213 years in Connecticut history when a meteorite crashed into what was once part of Western Connecticut. We learn how that space rock helped launch American science. You can join us too. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live.
This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalbathanchel broadcasting remotely. Coming up on Monday, nationally, the COVID-19 vaccine rollout has been going slower than experts had hoped. We'll talk with a reporter from Kaiser Health News about how vaccine distribution is going. We'll look at what's happening here in our state. That's Monday. Now, we've been talking about space this hour. Some believe a space rock that fell to Earth in Connecticut in 1807 helped launch the study of sciences in the United States. For more, joining me now on Zoom is Catherine Prince. She's a visiting assistant professor of journalism at SUNY Purchase and author of the nonfiction book, A Professor, a President, and a Meteor, The Birth of American Science. Catherine, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So I I mentioned this day in 1807. So tell me uh, what you know about what happened that day and what did witnesses say they observed? Um, So the event happened, it was December 14th, 1807, 630 in the morning. And just at that time, a ball of fire about, it looked to be about two thirds the size of the full moon from from the witness's perspective. Um, This was seen actually from Southern Vermont through Fairfield County, Connecticut. And witnesses later described hearing three loud booms. Um, One of them said it sounded like a cannonball rolling along a wooden floor. Um, So just to give you a perspective, like in Weston, there was a judge, Nathan Wheeler. He was taking his morning walk when he saw the sky illuminated. Dr. Isaac Bronson, who lived in um, what's now the Greenfield section near Fairfield. He was traveling along the Boston Post Road and the inside of his stagecoach lit up. But up, even in Vermont, in Rutland, Vermont, um, a man had looked up from his doorstop and saw a meteor heading south and in Rentham, Massachusetts. So they all see this, um, but then kind of you know, don't report it to anyone except for Isaac Bronson, whose friend was Benjamin Silliman. And he told him, and Benjamin Silliman drops everything, grabs a colleague who was a classics professor, James Kingsley, from Yale. Um, he, he wanted him because Kingsley was just had a really good skill for interviewing and writing. And the two of them come to Weston. Um, and of course, in 1807, at this time, Weston was encompassing what is now Trumbull and Easton as well. Mm. So that's what they see. And some of them think, uh, some of these witnesses think it's volcanoes on the moon. Some of them think it's something supernatural. They're not really quite sure exactly what they're seeing. Mm. So physically, how big was this meteorite? I understand that the largest known chunk, about the size of a basketball, sits on the third floor of the Yale Peabody, which is under uh, renovation now. But tell us about the meteorite that was found, the size. Right. Sure. So the meteorite ended up to be about um, 20 some odd pounds. Um, and, And upon his analysis, so what happened was you know, Silliman and Kingsley, they start interviewing people. Um, the the fragments, the first thing that they ran into, though, was actually some people were tr- going to try to sell fragments. And they didn't really know what it was, but they thought, well, maybe this is something valuable. So they had to try to stop that. And then um, Silliman starts sampling and, and testing what's on the ground there. And he sees that these stones have these round grains called chondrules in them, which he knew weren't present in earthly rocks. He had a geology background as well. So he knows these are, you know, these are from outer space. And of course he was familiar with this idea of of meteorites. You know, he, um, so he um, interviews the witnesses, he runs these tests and then he publishes his conclusion in the Connecticut Herald a couple weeks later, December 29th. He thought it might have been about a half mile in diameter before it broke up on entry. And he also estimated that it was traveling around 200 to 300 miles an hour. I'm sorry, a minute, not an hour. (laughs) And how did the American (laughs) public uh, react to his scientific research? Again, this is the Yale professor, Benjamin Silliman. Sure. So again, like he had, um, so one of the Westonites that was trying to sell it was a man named William Prince, who's no relation to me. Um, He and his (laughs) sons were also going to try to turn it into gold. So that was their reaction. You know, they kind of believed in alchemy. 
Um, but the, but the public, you know, at the time still, there's just such a skepticism, um, especially in, in New England at the time for science, there was a real competing religion science, um, divide going on, which I think in 2020, 2021, we, we can relate to, um, this, this issue is not new. And so Silliman really set out to educate the public uh, about this, you know, that yes, you know, you can have faith, but there is science and this is this, you know, scientific research that's just showing this was not, you know, some supernatural event, for example. Mm. I understand when we, when you t- walked us through how uh, Benjamin Silliman went out uh, into the field and he talked to eyewitnesses, collected specimens, analyzed them, then published his account. This is science. This is how science works. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I I think of him um, in some ways, he would have been, you know, like Neil deGrasse Tyson today, someone who had just made science accessible. He really felt um, that it was his obligation to not just talk to academia, but to talk to the public. And I think that was at the, you know, he was trying to live a bit of Benjamin Franklin's ideal, you know, like the more knowledge that gets out, the more informed citizenry we have, the better off we will be as a nation. You know, we were a new nation at the time, 31 Mm -hmm. years old. So, um, you know, I, I, I think he was trying to be also citizen scientist. So you mentioned, uh, again, the region being uh, religiously conservative. But what about some leading politicians? How did they react to Silliman's research? Right. So that's Thomas Thomas Jefferson, who is the president in the um, (laughs) title of the book. So there was a bit of um, there's this quote that has been wrongly um, attributed to Thomas Jefferson. But it was said, and this, this has persisted, that Jefferson said it is easier to believe the two Yankee professors could lie than to admit that stones could fall from heaven. There's really no evidence to to show that he actually said that. There was one scientist later in the 1860s who came across something that said, you know, Jefferson something, it is a lie. Part of the problem was um, New England was not thrilled about the Jefferson win in that election. I think the Hartford Current, if I remember correctly right now, put like a black band around the front page of the paper, you know, that you would do for a funeral. So there was a big divide politically that spilled over into this where um, some of the Congregationalists in New England really thought, you know, pursuing science was not virtuous. Um, there was a tendency to interpret some of this natural phenomena, you know, again, as something super natural. Not everyone. I mean, Silliman's mentor, Timothy Dwight, for example, from Yale, encouraged him to go into the sciences. But it, it played out a bit. There was definitely that political. Um, New England didn't think, you know, Jefferson's collecting of mammoth bones, for example, was, you know, something he should be doing. So when we talk about uh, Benjamin Silliman today and the legacy of his work on this media, right, tell us more about how it jump-started science in America. Did it put Connecticut on the map, too? I think it put Connecticut on the map. And, of course, Connecticut was on the map a bit during this time, um, not having anything to do with the science. But, you know, Connecticut at one point had um, there was that Hartford Convention, you know, flirting with the idea of science secession, but this definitely did. And it put Yale on the map. Um, he, so he just a quick little thing was he, he had thought about a career in law and Timothy Dwight actually said, you know, there's enough lawyers. How about science? So yeah. Silliman thought, Oh, uh-huh, you know, why not? So he pursued um, geology and mineralogy and he, he helped build the uh, Yale Peabody mineral collection. He, um, it was the first and like finest mineral collection at the time. He helped establish the Yale Medical School in 1813. He uh, persuaded the Yale Corporation, as it was known at the time, to de- establish the Department of the of Philosophy and the Arts, which was science. He also launched um, scientific journals, um, the American Scientific Journal. So. Having done all of that, um, and he lectured widely, he really believed in, uh, again, you know, reaching 
the the public about this. So the other um, thing that the reason the subtitle of Birth of America's Science is that his findings first get published in Connecticut, but then they uh, later get published you know, nationally, and then they get read internationally. And so for the first time, Europe looks now at this new nation and thinks, you know, maybe not such a backwater after all. You know, he, they, they have a seat at the table now, um, so to speak. <laughs> well, this has been really interesting. Again, Catherine Prince wrote the book, A Professor, a President, and a Meteor, The Birth of American Science. If you want to learn more about, again, what happened in 1807 when this meteorite crashed uh, into uh, Weston, Connecticut. Catherine, uh, we just have a couple of minutes. How did you get turned on to this story? So I got turned on to this story when it was the bicentennial because I I happened to live in Weston and the town celebrated the bicentennial of this some some years ago. And I I was really intrigued and I was really intrigued, I think, more for what it for what it was saying about where we were at the crossroads at the time in the United States. You know, it's 31 years after the end of the or for independence. And it's just this moment where, how are we going to go forward from a point of view of you know, science and education? And, um, you know, what, what are we going to do with all that? So I found that really captivating. And, um, and so I, I just, the, the people involved here, you know, I just, this image of him coming here and interviewing these, you know, New England farmers and judges and lawyers and their reactions to that. And I've just kind of always been interested um, in space and and, in NASA listening to your previous guest. I remember um, I grew up in Danbury, Connecticut, where the Hubble telescope Mm -hmm. lens was made and, you know, visitors from um, the laboratory coming there and talking to us as grade school kids. So it's kind of just been something I've been interested in and these somewhat, I guess, footnotes of history that I think tell a larger story. Mm. Well, we appreciate your time, Catherine Prince, visiting assistant professor of journalism at SUNY Purchase, and again, author of A Professor, A President, and a Meteor, The Birth of American Science. Put it on your reading list for 2021. Catherine, thank you. And we want to let our listeners know, we heard about this story through Connecticut Mag and the Connecticut Files History Column by Eric Ofgan. Thank you, Eric, uh, for the heads up on this very interesting story. Today's show, produced by Carmen Baskoff, our technical producer is Catherine. Pastor uh, on the phones today, Tess Terrible. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. We did it. We made it through another week. We hope you're back with us on Monday.